Good evening, my dear friends and colleagues. Today we will start our next chapter in Comprehensive Clinical Nephrology Textbook, which is the Congenital and Hereditary Disorders. And of course, we will start by the most important one, which is the Autosomal Dominant Polycystic Kidney Disease, a very important topic in our clinical practice. This is our agenda. We'll start by the definition. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, from its name, it's an autosomal dominant disorder. It's a genetic disorder characterized by, inherited as an autosomal dominant pattern. It is a kidney disease characterized by multiple, multiple bilateral renal cysts. So it is a multi-system disease characterized by mainly affecting the kidneys in the form of multiple bilateral cysts associated also with cysts in other organs, especially the liver, pancreas, and arachnoid membranes. What about the inheritance or the genetics? As we said, it is inherited as an autosomal dominant manner. It is characterized by mutations in genes called BKD1, polycystic kidney disease 1, located on chromosome 16. This is very important for the exam. This is a very common question. BKD1 gene located on chromosome 16 and BKD2 located on chromosome 4. Again, BKD1 chromosome 16 and BKD2 chromosome 4. These genes from its name are responsible for the synthesis of a pro for sense of proteins called Polycystine 1, BKD1, will, will, uh, is responsible for polycystine 1, and BKD2 is responsible for polycystine 2. Both these proteins, polycystine 1 and 2, are expressed throughout the, uh, throughout the body. BKD1 mutation are characterized by being, by being more common and causing more aggressive disease. This is also a common question. BKD1 compared to BKD2 mutations, BKD1 mutations are much more common and causing more aggressive disease. This is also, there is a, a mutations in a third gene, recent one called GANAB protein, which have been identified in families with mild forms of polycystic kidney. This is a, 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 maybe a question either in the fellowship or in the European board exam. Third new gene mutation called GANAB. What about the pathophysiology? Polycystine 1, polycystine 1 is a membrane receptor. Polycystine 2 is a calcium permeable channel. So, polycystine 1, which is a membrane receptor, will co localize with polycystine 2, which is a calcium channel. Both are present in the cilia, in the cilia of the epithelial cells of the renal tubules. So again, both these proteins are present in the epithelial cells of the renal tubules, in the cilia. Polycystine 1 is a receptor, polycystine 2 is a calcium channel. Both form a complex called polycystine complex, and this complex acts as an extracellular mechanosensor. It acts as a sensor, as a sensor for the epithelial cells regulating or which helps in the regulation of cell proliferation, adhesion, and differentiation and maturation of the epithelial cells. So again, polycystine 1 and polycystine 2 form the polycystine complex, acting as a sensor or a mechanosensor in the renal epithelial cells, in the epithelial cells of the renal tubules, helping in the regulation of cell proliferation, adhesion, and differentiation. While when there is mutation in BKD1 and BKD2, 
causing defective synthesis of both these proteins, polycysteine 1 and polycysteine 2. So it will cause failure, failure of this complex to be formed, resulting in dysregulation, dysregulation in the cell turnover, and most importantly, uncontrolled cell proliferation. So defective polycysteine complex, this will cause uncontrolled cell proliferation in the kidney. A very common question also, what is the percentage of the affected, of the affected nephrons that will uh, uh, undergo cystic transformation? This cystic transformation will be present in only less than 1% of the, of the nephrons. This is a common question in the fellowship and European board exam. Only less than 1% of the nephrons will undergo cystic transformation. What about the molecular level? At the molecular level, this is very important. When there is defect in polycysteine 1 and polycysteine 2, this will cause decreased, decreased intracellular calcium. Here we are in the epithelial cells of the renal tubules. This will lead to decreased intracellular calcium, which will cause inhibition or decreased phosphodiesterase 1. So decreased intracellular calcium and decreased phosphodiesterase 1. Also, there will be accumulation, accumulation or increased level of cyclic AMB that will cause activation of protein kinase A, of protein kinase A, and this activation of protein kinase A will cause phosphorylation of what is called cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. So activation of protein kinase A will cause phosphorylation of cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. This will lead to stimulation of or causing fluid secretion through chloride channels will cause chloride driven fluid secretion also activation of protein kinase A will cause will cause activation of what is called sarcoma proteins also activation of mitogen activated protein kinase and activation of mammalian target of rabamycin that will lead to at the end uncontrolled cell proliferation. So again, what is the summary? At the molecular level, what will happen in the renal epithelial cells? Decreased intracellular calcium, decreased phosphodiesterase 1, accumulation of cyclic AMB, activation of protein kinase A that will lead to phosphorylation of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator and chloride-driven fluid secretion. Also, Protein kinase uh, activation, protein kinase A activation will activate sarcoma proteins, mitogen, uh, uh, mitogen activated protein kinase, and mammalian target of rabamycin activation that will lead to finally cell proliferation. What about the epidemiology? Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease occurs worldwide and in all races it's a common a very common congenital disorder and inherited disorder and with a prevalence a prevalence of the genetically affected individuals at birth of about one to uh, in each 400 up to one in each 1000 affected individuals in most patients as we see in our clinical practice the diagnosis is made decades later, not at birth, and some patients are never diagnosed. At any point of time, only a fraction of the genetically affected individuals are aware of having the disease. Usually, most of them are asymptomatic. And of course, patients can present with a family history 
of the uh, of the disease in their uh, family and a careful history of for renal disease hypertension stroke or premature death should be obtained as we said before the inheritance is autosomal dominant so 50 percent 50 percent of the offspring should be affected but also an important note that 25 to 40 percent of new patients <clears throat> have no no family history 25 to 40 pay to 40 percent of the new patients will have no family history and are caused by new mutations what about the clinical manifestations we will start by the kidney It may, uh, patients might present with flank or loin pain, flank or loin pain, might present with hematuria, might present with hypertension, nocturia and polyuria, which results from loss of the urinary concentrating ability of the tubules, and low-grade proteinuria. And the most common manifestations are pain, hematuria, and hypertension. Of course, as we said in the kidney, the kidney increase, uh, renal size increase with age, and renal enlargement usually occurs in 100% of the patients. The severity of the structural abnormality, of course, will correlate with the manifestations when the kidney, when the kidney become much more larger in size. This will cause much more manifestations, especially pain and hematuria, hypertension, and renal impairment. When the kidney reaches a massive size, it, uh, it may lead to compressive symptoms and compression of the nearby, uh, nearby structures, especially the inferior vena cava or the GIT. In the CRISP study, which is the Consortium for Radiological Imaging Studies of Polycystic Kidney Disease, known as the CRESP study. They have shown that the total kidney volume and cyst volume will increase exponentially at a rapid rate. And the, rate, the rates of growth in this study was con constant at, at about 5.3% per year. And this might be a question. So in the CRISP study, the rate of growth for the cyst in the kidney was about 5.3% per year. But in our practice, as we know, and as we see in our practice, the rate of growth is highly variable from one patient to another. One patient might progress very rapidly and the others might have very benign course over a long period of years. And usually the baseline total kidney volume predict the, sus the subsequent rate of increase in the renal volume and declining GFR. So the baseline total kidney volume has a very important role in the prognosis. What about hypertension? We are still in the kidney, in the kidney manifestation, and we will talk now about the hypertension. Hypertension is the most common manifestation of uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. A major contributor to the renal disease progression, as in all of the renal diseases, uh, hypertension is a major, major risk factor for progression and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Microalbuminuria, proteinuria, and hematuria are, uh, uh, are risk factors for uh, renal decline or renal progression are much more common in hypertensive patients compared to non-hypertensive patients. And also, hypertensive, hypertensive patients have increased morbidity from the intra, from valvular heart disease and importantly, intracranial aneurysm. So, the conclusion is that hypertension is a very common manifestation 
a very important role in renal disease progression and cardiovascular mortality. What about CKD and reaching the end stage uh, renal disease in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease? In most patients, as I'm, uh, I just said, the renal function, renal function is maintained within the normal range for a very long period, despite the increased growth in the renal cyst, usually until the fourth and sixth decade. And that's what we see in our patients. Despite the very huge size of the kidney, usually, usually the kidney will maintain its function for a much longer period, usually to the fourth and sixth decade. When the kidney function starts to decline, the kidneys are usually very large, are very large in size. And the average rate of GFR decline, this is important. This is important. The average decline in GFR is about 4.4 to 5.9 milli per minute per year. This is an important note to know. Also, an important percentage to know that up to 77% of the patients are having preserved renal function at the age of 50 years. At the age of 50, so 77% of the patients reaches the age of 50 years having preserved kidney function and at the age of 73 years, about 52% of the patients, 52% are having observed kidney function. These percentages are very important to reassure your patient, to reassure, especially in the young age population, that with careful follow-up of the GFR, of the blood pressure, of the proteinuria that usually the decline is very late but with very close follow-up and control of the risk factors. Also an important note to know that men's or males are usually have a trend to progress much more common than females. So male patients or risk factors for progression and usually they decline earlier than females reaching the end stage renal disease at a younger age compared to females. What are the other risk factors for progression? As we said the first risk factor for progression is male gender. Other risk factors include the black race, and also, if the diagnosis is made before age of 30, we mean early diagnosis, first hematuria before the age of 30, hypertension before 35, hyperlipidemia, low level of HDL, sickle cell trait, and as we said, BKD1, especially truncating mutations. Truncating mutations are um, risk factor for progression and these risk factors are important to know and are very common in uh, exam questions. Recently also in the HOLT BKD trial showed that there is an association between dietary sodium and the rate of kidney growth. Also the CRIS study which we, uh, which we discussed before, the CRISP study confirmed that the kidney and cyst volume, the kidney and cyst volume are the strongest predictor for renal function decline. All of these are very common to be asked for, the CRISP study and the risk factor for progression. What about 
the hematuria and cyst hemorrhage, we are still in the clinical manifestations in the kidney. Hematuria and cyst hemorrhage. Visible hematuria usually occurs in up to 40% of the patients. And differential diagnosis of hematuria in our patient includes cyst hemorrhage, stones, infections, and tumor. Cyst hemorrhage is a very frequent, as we said, and it might present our patient uh, a cyst hemorrhage might be present with growth hematuria if the cyst communicates with the collecting duct but if it doesn't communicate usually it presents with flank pain if there is hemorrhage in the cyst or if this if the cyst rupture unfortunately it might cause retroperitoneal hemorrhage that can be significant and life-threatening requiring blood transfusion but in most of the cases if there is hemorrhage in the in in a cyst usually it is self-limiting resolving within two to seven days but if the symptoms persist in the form of hematuria and flank pain longer than one week Or if this hematuria occurs after the age of 50, new blasm should be excluded. New blasm should be excluded. What about cyst infection? We talked about cyst hemorrhage. What about cyst infection? Infection is common in our patients, and UTI might might occur in the form of cystitis. Acute pyelonephritis, cyst infection, and perinephric abscess. As in the general population, women are more affected than males. The most common organism is Escherichia coli, as expected. The route of infection in the cyst infections and acute pyelonephritis is retrograde from the bladder. So, each episode of cystitis should be treated adequately. CT and the MRI are very sensitive to detect a complicated cyst. So to diagnose or to, to for early diagnosis of cyst infections, cyst hemorrhage, CT and the MRI are very helpful. What about the stones? What about the stones? A very important number stones will occur in about 20% 20% of autosomal dominant uh, polycystic kidney disease patients very important to know and the stones usually are composed of the common stone types in uh, autosomal dominant BKD the common stone types include uric acid calcium oxalate or both uric acid, calcium oxalate, or pose. Uric acid stones are very common in our patients. CT urography. CT urography is now the investigation of choice in many centers compared to LIV, uh, LIV urography because CT, CT UT or CT urography is much more sensitive in detecting small or radiolucent stones also for differentiating stones from tumors which are very important to uh, to do a new modality called dual energy ct is increasingly used to distinguish calcium from uric acid stones and this might be questioned in the old exam dual energy ct can differentiate between calcium and uric acid stones. Now we will talk, we, uh, we finish the kidney affection. The kidney might present, as we said, to, uh, to summarize by pain, loin pain, might present with hematuria, either cyst hemorrhage, cyst infections or UTI, or, and stones. All of these can occur, and of course, the kidney might present with 
hypertension and CKD or GFR decline and we discuss each one in detail. What about the liver? A liver usually of course the liver will be affected by in the form of cyst like the kidney and it's called polycystic liver disease and the liver is the most common extra renal manifestation the most common extra renal organ to be affected is the liver and also it is associated with BKD1 and BKD2 mutations hepatic cysts are rare in children and their incidence increases with age women who have multiple pregnancies or taking oral contraceptive pills or estrogen replacement therapy usually have a much worse disease so again what are the risk factors for having a more aggressive liver affection women with multiple pregnancies or taking uh, OCBs or estrogen replacement therapy usually polycystic livers patient with polycystic liver they are asymptomatic but symptoms can occur of course can occur as a mass effect from the cyst cyst causing mass effect compressing other organs or due to affection of the cyst itself either in the form of hemorrhage or infection mass effect from uh, the cyst or compression might present with dyspnea or sodnia, early satiety, GERD, low back pain, uterine prolapse, and red fractures. Might also cause hepatic venous outflow obstruction, IVC compression, portal vein compression, and bile duct compression causing obstructed joints. All of these are due to the mass effect or compression uh, manifestations. What about intracranial aneurysm? And this is very, very important to know in details. As we said in stones to be occurred in 20%, it is very important to know that intracranial aneurysm are usually occurring about 8% of the patients. Intracranial aneurysm are present in 8% of the patients. And this prevalence or this frequency is variable. If there is negative family history, negative family history for intracranial aneurysm, this incidence decreased up to 6%. But if there is a positive family history for intracranial aneurysm, the incidence increases up to 16%. So the frequency and usually it is a, 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 a frequent question by the patients or the relatives. Do I will get or what is the percentage to have intracranial aneurysm? You should tell your patient that the average is 8%. If you have a positive family history, it will increase up to 16%. If there is a negative family history, it will decrease to 6%. Very common question. Most of if the patient have intracranial aneurysm usually they are asymptomatic or they might present with focal findings like cranial nerve palsy and convulsions cranial nerve palsy and convulsions and most importantly what we fear from is rupture of intracranial aneurysm causing hemorrhage intracranial hemorrhage as expected, the rupture rate increases with the size, ranging from only 0.5%, point, the rupture rate is 0.5% in aneurysm less than 5 millimeters, up to 4% rupture rate in aneurysms larger than 10 millimeters.
and also these numbers are very important. So in a less than five millimeter, the rupture rate is 0.5 percent. Larger than 10 millimeter, the rupture rate is 4 percent. And if the rupture occurs and hemorrhage unfortunately happens, the risk the risk for severe morbidity and mortality usually between 35 and 55 percent. The mean age of rupture of the intracranial aneurysm is 39 years. Most patients have normal renal functions and around 30% have normal blood pressure uh, rupture. Screening is not indicated for all patients. Again, screening for intracranial aneurysm is not indicated in all patients with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, very important. So what are the indications? What are the indications for screening? The indications include family history. If there is a family history of intracranial aneurysm or if there is family history of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Screening usually is indicated if there is a previous rupture, of course, or if, if we are preparing for elective surgery with expected hemodynamic instability in this surgery, and also screening is indicated in high-risk occupations like airplane pilots, and of course, if, if the patient, as we see that in our clinical practice, if the patient having severe anxiety, severe anxiety about fear from having intracranial aneurysm and rupture, uh, and the patient are insisting to do screening for that. So again, what are the indications for screening for intracranial aneurysm? Family history of aneurysm or family history of subarachnoid hemorrhage or previous rupture or preparation for elective surgery, high-risk occupations, and patient anxiety. How we screen for? This is a very important question. We should we, we screen for intracranial aneurysm by mag MRA, magnetic resonance angiography. Magnetic resonance angiography is a diagnostic imaging modality of choice for pre-symptomatic screening. The MRE are the imaging of choice because it is non-invasive and does not require ID contrast. Also, CT angiography is can be a, a satisfactory alternative if there is no contraindication to IV contrast. If there is no contraindication to IV contrast, we can ask for CT angiography. Repeated screening, repeated screening can be done in patients with a strong family history of intracranial aneurysm or aneurysmal rupture after 5 to 10 years from the initial screening. So we can repeat the screening in patients with a strong family history for aneurysms or rupture. What about the other vascular abnormalities? in our patient in autosomal dominant persistent kidney disease. Other vascular abnormalities might include thoracic aortic dissections, might include dissections, especially in the thoracic aorta or cervical cephalic artery. Other abnormalities include coronary artery aneurysm, retinal artery and vein occlusions, so the vascular abnormalities include dissections, especially in the thoracic aorta, aneurysms in the coronary artery, occlusions in the retinal artery and retinal vein. Thoracic artery dissection are seven times more than other cases. What about the cardiac manifestations? We, we have spoken about the kidney, the liver, and the intracranial aneurysm and uh, and vascular 
uh, affection. Now we'll talk about the heart. Mitral valve prolapse is the most common valvular abnormality, and this is a very common question. Mitral valve prolapse is the most common valvular abnormality in our patients, and it occurs in up to 25%. Other abnormalities uh, that might occur include mitral regurg, tricuspid regurg, and tricuspid prolapse in the aortic radius. And it also, it is important to know that valve replacement is rarely required. Valve replacement is rarely required. And we, we shouldn't ask for uh, echocardiography to screen for these abnormalities unless there is a murmur. We shouldn't ask for an echocardiography unless we detect a murmur. Also, a very minute or a very mild pericardial effusion can be noted. What about the other manifestations or other affections in different organs? Cysts might occur in uh, uh, different organs, including the pancreas, seminal vesicles, and the arachnoid membrane. The seminal vesicle, seminal vesicle cysts, cysts in the seminal vesicles are usually multiple and bilateral and are present in 40% of the patients. Ovarian cysts are not associated with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, a common question by the patients. Pancreas and the arachnoid membrane cysts are present in 5 and 8 percent in the pancreas. Pancreas cysts are present in 5 percent of the patient and the arachnoid membrane cysts are present in 8 percent of the patients. Pancreas cysts are usually asymptomatic and rarely causing pancreatitis. What about cysts in the epididymis and prostate it can occur with increasing frequency. Male patients might have sperm abnormalities with defective motility, but rarely causing infertility. Very rare to cause infertility. Spinal meningeal diverticuli might occur and might cause intracranial hypotension. Also, there is increased incidence of colonic and uvenal diverticulosis. There is increased frequency of diverticulosis in the colon and duodenum. We have finished uh, uh, our part one and we will continue the diagnosis and management with the recent drugs in part two, inshallah. Thank you.